and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this live stream event. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just quickly review two items. Our code of conduct. So Microsoft Reactor seeks to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and our presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but we just ask that you're mindful of your commentary remaining professional and on topic. So just take a moment to review this code of conduct. And then uh, this session is coming to you live on YouTube. It will be available for on-demand access in 48 to 72 hours. Um, if you've not been on a live stream before through YouTube, just note that you do need to have um, an account set up so that you can interact in the chat. Um, if you're unable to ask your questions while we are live, feel free to reach out to us through Meetup um, and we'll get those questions answered. So today's session, the reactor is pleased to be joined by M. Darcy and a Microsoft Business Applications MVP. They will be introducing you to governance for Power Platform. So let me bring our speaker up. Hello, and thank you for joining Hi. us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this topic. It's my favorite thing in the world to do. <laughs> Super excited to have you as well. Um, I will, did you want me to pull your screen up? Pull yeah, now? Okay, I think we good to go. All right, and then I will see you all later and I'll see you in the chat. Great, so hoping you guys can hear me. There should be uh, a slight, very soothing music in the background. Hopefully you guys are getting that too. Um, so today we're actually going to be doing something a little bit different to your regular ta tech talks. I like to think, okay, we'll give that a quick shot and we can tell we're not hearing the audio. So just one second and we'll get that fixed. All right. All right, perfect. Okay, great. So the aim of today's session is to guide you through a little bit about governance and specifically for the Power Platform today. And honestly, this can really be applied to pretty much any kind of governance situation. If you're talking about SharePoint or anything like that, the, the, the theory is really all the same, but I'm going to be focusing specifically on Power Platform today. So a quick introduction to myself, then I'm going to turn off my camera and we're going to focus on the different various aspects of governance today. My name is M. Darcy and I use she, they pronouns. So that means you can use either of those as you wish interchange interchangeably. I am a two times Microsoft MVP specializing in Power Platform and I also am a senior solution architect. Don't let the accent fool you. I'm actually based in Center City, Philadelphia, but yes, I am originally from Ireland. All right, so I'm going to now turn off my camera so that we can kind of focus on the images and talk a little bit around governance today and just kind of how we can change it from being such a bad feeling word to something that actually really needs to be very positive. Okay, so let's kind of get started. And first things first, I would love you to kind of think of the word governance and kind of think a little bit about what kind of thoughts and feelings does the word governance bring up? And for a lot of us who are working in IT or a lot of us who are working kind of any form of administration, it can really make you feel very, very anxious. And I honestly started to feel my blood pressure rising when somebody comes up and says, hey, we need to put a governance model in place for this new platform. It can really start to feel very, very overwhelming. And it's a word that can strike a lot of fear into the hearts of many different people, even the most confident of IT admins. But today, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a guidance on as to why it definitely does not need to feel that way. And it definitely is more of an assistance to those of us who are supporting our organizations from an IT perspective. So when we get to the very, very core of why we need governance, it all really comes back to one very simple idea. And I think this is something that I am starting to become very loud about in the Power Platform space. We want to make a safe space for our makers. Now, for those of us who are not super familiar with the Power Platform as a whole, the whole idea is to allow our business users to create their own 
business solutions, and we call those people makers of the Power Platform. We want to create a way that allows our makers to create, build, and explore all the possibilities of the Power Platform, but we have to do it in a secure, safe way that does not put any risk to the business. So when our makers are actually given the space to create their own solutions, but they're given the space in a non-restrictive way, but in a way that's also secure. So when the makers are creating and developing, they don't feel these guardrails, these very strict red tape around them. If we give them that space to create, we actually start to nurture folks to design innovative and productive business solutions by themselves. But the beautiful part of this is they don't need to inform IT of this and they don't need our assistance to create their own business solutions. By creating these safe spaces, it not only protects our business as our makers grow, it actually allows makers to develop their confidence over time. So knowing that while they experiment and learn, they are absolutely safe and they're not going to impact our business organization in any way. And that actually is very positive for makers because confidence is hugely important. And especially in the early days of the power platform, especially when we talk about adoption, we have to ensure that makers have the safe space and the resources they need to fully invest in the power platform for it to be successful. And to give you an analogy of why this is so important, I'm actually going to go back to a memory that most of us probably have from childhood. At least I know I did. And growing up in Ireland, this definitely resonates very much with me. So most of us when we were growing up, we learned to ride a bicycle. Did you ever learn to ride a bicycle when you were growing up? And if you did, what kind of safety mechanisms did you have in place? So for example, did you have a helmet? I really hope so. Did you have a helmet to help you in case you fell? Did you have training wheels to help you balance? More importantly, did you have somebody there kind of guiding you and encouraging you and helping you learn how to cycle correctly? It's very, very important that we have these support structures in place for our makers. Similarly, do you remember the first time you fell off your bicycle? And if you do, do you remember, was there someone there to actually pick you up and help you get back on and encourage you? Maybe they kind of bandaged up your knee, if you scraped your knee, etc. It's important to note that we have these supports in place for not only people who learn how to ride bicycles, but also our makers who are learning how to use the power platform. If you didn't have somebody there to support you, your confidence would take a massive knock and it would be very difficult to get back on that bike and learn how to do it by yourself. The exact same idea really applies to the makers in the power platform. If we do not have supports in place for the makers, if they do make a mistake or they do run into a roadblock and they don't have that support or the resources there to figure it out or grow or fix the issue, they're going to give up very, very quickly, especially in the early days. So it's vitally important we provide them with resources and encouragement they need when they run into a challenge. Why is it so important to have that, make, that safe space for our makers to grow? Well, we need to go back to the very core of the purpose of the power platform. And to do that, you need to think about your organization just for a second. What is it that every single organization needs to sustain itself above all other things? Well, it's not time, it's not money, it's not assets. I mean, yes, we absolutely need those things, but we actually need people, we need humans. And without people and without humans, we really don't have an organization. They are very much at the center of everything we do. And a lot of us today, we're really feeling the pressure to ensure that we maintain our most precious resource, which are people. We're also experiencing massive labor shortages across the entire globe in all different industries. They are very much the center of what we do at an organization. And the demand for this resource is higher than ever. I think we've all seen it, especially in our industry. It is absolutely vital that we give people those tools that they need to automate monotonous and manual tasks. And we need to be able to free up their time to focus on innovation and productivity. And those are the things that no machine or automation can truly replace. So we very much have to put our most important resource at the center of everything we do when we talk about Power Platform. I mean, yes, we could go out and we could hire a developer to build the automations for us, or we could purchase some form of a solution from the marketplace to fit one particular department. But when you think about it, when you think 
of yourself when you were in a business user role. We know the solutions best. Business users know their roles best. They know more than anybody else what problems need to be solved at their core level. And they know what needs to be optimized and where their time is most valuably spent. So instead of burdening IT with finding that solution or going down a very costly road and developing a custom solution from an outside source to build something that's going to solve a smaller problem that may be life-changing or game-changing to a particular individual in their role, we actually can give the ability to those people to build their own solutions without needing that assistance from IT or developers. And when people have the ability to build their own solutions, we're now doing things like reducing shadow IT. We're giving time back to our IT departments to focus on important things, critical tasks. And we're able to really empower people to do things that they want to do and free up their time to focus on what's important to the organization. When we provide a platform for people to create and build their own solutions, we're really empowering them to think outside the box and to start to innovate freely. And when people no longer have that burden of working those repetitive manual tasks, we're able to do amazing things. We're able to improve morale. We're able to allow people to grow and to develop within the organization. And we're really allowing them to reach their full potential. So it's really, really exciting. But empowering people to build their own solutions, it really does so much more for the organization. Not only are we improving morale, are we improving productivity, are we giving the power to individuals to create those solutions? More importantly, some might argue, we're giving time and resources back to our IT departments, as I mentioned earlier, to focus on things that are more critical to the organization. Before these solution platforms were born, IT departments were always tasked with finding solutions to business problems. I've definitely experienced this in my time working in IT. Anytime somebody needs a solution for a small problem, either they'll go out and they'll find some form of solution themselves and they'll download it and we won't know anything about it until it starts causing a virus on everybody's laptop and causing a much larger issue. We also might have the issue of where somebody may purchase a solution or a SaaS model out of the box and not actually let IT know. And all of a sudden we're stuck with integrating it. And then we have to integrate it. We have to support it. We have to do all the different things that come. Whereas if they come to us at the start or we even better give them the tool to do it themselves, we are then free from that really monotonous task. So once all of that is done, if we're able to empower a business user to create and build their own solution, think of the massive amount of time and resources we are giving back to our IT departments. So now we have happy people building their own solutions, autom automating some of those monotonous situations. And we have IT admins who no longer have to figure out why Pete's laptop has 17 viruses on it and is spreading out all of this kind of data out of production. It really does give peace of mind to everybody in the organization, it pretty much makes everybody happy. Knowing that our makers have those safe spaces to build, it's going to put IT department minds at ease. And it's also going to free them to concentrate on that critical infrastructure that keeps our organization moving. So by empowering people at every part of our business, we are freeing up the most precious commodity in the world today, time. You cannot buy time. As much as I try, you can't do it but we're also allowing people to realize their full potential. And this goes so much further than just the organization. And I have so many examples out here in the community of people who discovered the Power Platform and literally turned it into their whole entire career. In fact, I would say 90% of my colleagues at my current organization did this exact thing. Many of my closest friends in the community did this very similar thing. For example, a very dear friend of mine, Keith Watling, that most of you would know, he actually discovered the Power Platform while he was employed as a bus driver. And he actually used it to implement solutions at his organization. And today he is probably one of the best known Microsoft MVPs, and he's a leader in our Power Platform community. So I also think of some other friends who've done the exact same thing and made this an entire career. So for example, my good friend Samit Saini over at Heathrow Airport, he actually implemented a power platform solution that impacts 200,000 people who go through the airport every single day. And when you think about that, empowering our people goes way beyond just impacting makers, supporting the organization. It can very much be something that impacts 
a whole organization and it only takes one person to do that and make that happen. So now we know about the incredible benefits the Power Platform can offer. How do we create these safe spaces for makers? We need to get into the actual how to do part of making this happen. And we have to put the support and protection in place before we allow our makers to explore. It's really important. And the first thing is we're going to set up environments that are going to be designated as makers learning spots. And this environment will be accessible to all makers, but it's gonna have very key guardrails in place. It means that our business data and our critical applications are going to be kept safe while makers are learning. And to create these guardrails, we're gonna to need to look at what connectors are available within those environments. We need to ensure that our makers don't have access to connectors that could be potentially impactful from a business security perspective. We do not want people being able to access the Twitter connector alongside production data. Definitely a cause for concern there. So what we do is we're going to create things that are called data loss prevention policies, or now known as data policies. And that's going to ensure that our makers have the freedom to develop their skills and create whatever it is that they want without a risk to the actual business data. And data loss prevention policies are essentially a set of rules that can be applied at either your tenant level or your environment level or both. And they basically dictate what connectors can and cannot be used in the environment together. And that's really a great starting place for managing our costs as well. This is how we can ensure that our makers are utilizing connectors that don't incur additional licensing costs. And it means that they're able to start to explore the possibilities of the power platform in a very safe way. This also ensures that we are being mindful of our costs with new connectors. We can also adjust our data loss prevention policies to prevent access to the premium connectors. And we can also put policies in place that says, hey, if this maker does need access to this premium connector, they can actually request it. They need to give us a reason as to why they need to request it. We're taking a very much a crawl, walk, run approach to the power platform, knowing that the makers are supported at every single step and are engaging with us on what they need. Now, our IT admins also have this peace of mind. Their makers are exploring and creating, and there is no risk to the business at this point. Ensuring your makers are supported, especially in the early stages of adoption, is absolutely vital to the success of the Power Platform. As I mentioned earlier, if makers run into a challenge they cannot easily get support for, confidence and enthusiasm for the platform will very negatively be impacted. And it's so difficult to get that enthusiasm back for a platform. Providing support in the form of training and community building will go a long way in your adoption journey. But how exactly do you provide that support? Well, every successful Power Platform implementation is really centered around a core group of people who understand and see the value in empowering makers. And frequently, we call this group of people the center of excellence for the Power Platform. And usually, we designate ownership of the platform to this team. So a key difference with Power Platform and individual software implementations is that the platform is actually owned by a team of people that actually come from multiple parts of the organization, various business users, IT admins, evangelists, everybody that understands the value of the power platform is responsible for making the platform successful. The center of excellence team is instrumental in supporting an organization's first set of makers. And once we support and nurture our makers, we're starting to cultivate a community of super makers that will inspire and support your power platform community at every level. And this is vital. It very much is a teach a man to fish type situation. You start out with your base, your first set of makers. And then when they see the value and they become very enthusiastic, they are then able to start training everybody else. And so the responsibility becomes less and less in IT and becomes more of an organizational response. One of the other things that's really important to note is that if you hand a maker a blank page, if you hand me a blank page, the, limit, the limitless possibilities may not initially be obvious. In fact, it may seem very, very overwhelming. So if I hand the platform to somebody who's never used it before and said, hey, go make an app, go make a solution, it's really hard to know where to start. So this is where the Center of Excellence team can really come in and we can start to inspire our makers 
we can actually start building out a template of apps, flows, and components, and that will actually give your makers a jump start on their journey. Even further, we can start to showcase these solutions built by other makers to ignite inspiration in other departments. So supporting our makers also means teaching them development best practices. And I think this is a place that a lot of organizations often fall short. Remember that the majority of our makers very likely don't come from a background of development. So what may seem obvious to, let's say ourselves who have worked in IT for a while, might not be as obvious to a new maker. And so when teaching makers, we really need to start from the start by instilling best practices, such as this is a solution and this is how you develop in a solution. These are the code, these are the code conventions that we use in this organization. These are the naming conventions that we use. And this is what application lifecycle management means. So explaining that to the maker, but also explaining why that's important to the maker means that you are creating makers that are going to be developing consistently across the organization. Everyone's speaking the same language. And that means long-term, you're reducing the likelihood of technical debt. And this is so important when our makers start to graduate from creating productivity apps to important apps that support a larger workload. There is absolutely no wrong time to start implementing a governance strategy. There are good times and there's definitely better times, but there's no wrong time. But before we implement, we need to have a very clear picture of the current landscape at an organization. The one thing that I've learned doing this over the last three years is that every power platform implementation is completely different. And therefore every governance strategy you take is going to be different. Some organizations may have 5,000 apps in their default environment and absolutely no strategy in place and that's okay. Other organizations might just be starting out in their power platform journey and want to put the guardrails in place first before allowing makers access. And that's completely okay too. And I've often seen situations where an organization will say, we are not going to use the power platform here. But in fact, people have already discovered the purple button app and they know exactly what's going on and they've gotten curious. Regardless of where you're at with your current power platform landscape, we have to get a clear picture of how the platform is currently being used. Without that visibility, we cannot determine what is currently being built and who is building it. If solutions are being built, we have to have an understanding of the importance of these solutions before we implement changes. That those, in, those changes may impact individuals, individuals already utilizing the solution. And once we have that clearer picture of the landscape, we can start to formulate a roadmap that will allow us to crawl, walk, and run. From here, we can start to analyze the maturity level of the organization from security all the way up to nurturing. And we can start to put practices and tools in place to build upon these maturity levels and help the platform grow, but at the scale the organization is comfortable with. So how do we build out that initial landscape and how do we get visibility over this platform? How can we tell what impacts our new security policies are going to have on an environment? Well, luckily for us, there are some fantastic tools that are available that are going to help us with our governance journey. Many of us have already heard of the Center of Excellence Starter Kit, but if you have not, allow me to introduce you to the multi-tool or the leatherman really of the power platform governance world. The Center of Excellence Starter Kit is a suite of tools built by Microsoft and the power platform community to provide assistance to organizations implementing governance for the power platform. At its absolute most basic, it's going to give you the visibility of everything being built on the power platform within that specific tenant from your apps, your flows, your connectors, your chatbot, everything. And we can see exactly what are being used and what our makers are making. Most tools built by the community for the community, it is completely free to use. It's fantastic. Having visibility is really at the core of the center of excellence tool, but really when you start to dig into it, it is very much more than that. The tool is going to include a suite of apps that are going to guide you on things like impact of a DLP policy when you implement it in a given solution or given environment. It's also going to allow admins to do bulk updates of permissions to apps and flows with the click of a button. And it's going to save an admin a significant amount of time when doing these things. 
sprawl is always at the top of mind with any government conversation I go into. And the Center of Excellence Toolkit has a fantastic solution to assist us by allowing us to mark apps and flows for archival if they're no longer in use. Not only is this a massive time saver, it's also reducing the burden on IT and pushing that back to the maker to ensure that everything they are building is being used and is being maintained. Anything that's not being used or maintained is going to be archived. So we're really saving at every opportunity here. It is also very important to note that the starter kit is exactly that. It is a starter kit that's going to give you the basics to kickstart your governance plan. The magic is that it's built on the Power Platform, so it can even be modified and extended to give your admin teams exactly what they want to implement and maintain your governance strategy. Like anything worth its salt, it's going to take time to implement and understand successfully, and it should be treated like a mini project. You're going to analyze what tools are needed in the immediate future and build out a rollout plan by prioritizing needs in line with the organization's maturity level and governance needs. Again, remember, it is a starter kit and it's absolutely not a silver bullet that will solve all governance issues overnight. Did you know that a typical Power Platform landscape contains only 20% of apps that are deemed business critical? A good governance plan should ensure that IT resources are focused on our critical applications that are much more complex in nature. Our other 80% of applications consist of <clears throat> important and productivity solutions, and those really should be managed by their makers and business units. In order to shift the burden of supporting the entire landscape from IT admins over to our makers, we have to enable our makers to be self-sufficient. And our first step was creating the safe space for makers, which allows them to explore <clears throat> without needing support or guidance from IT. We also need to ensure that solutions are being built and managed and owned by the makers. They are responsible for the full application lifecycle management of the solution, including support. Makers should be taught how and where to access support and educational resources should be built in a way that is compliant with the standards set by the organization. <clears throat> There are tools and resources available within the CUE Starter Kit to help give our makers that visibility, meaning they no longer need a physical resource to review or advise on guidelines. We also have tools available to us to actually automate any requests for environments. So for example, if a maker needs access to a specific environment or connector, we can automate that request and actually ask basic questions an IT admin would generally have asked beforehand. We can also make customizations to the COK kit and actually track things like training and development. And that way we can ensure only makers who have met certain standards set by the business that can access environments that are higher risk with some of those more critical connectors that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> by providing these tools and shifting ownership of solutions to our makers, we're starting to create a community of makers that are self-sufficient and thus we're actually reducing that pressure on IT departments to support the entire landscape. So now we need to start planning ahead. What do we do with those makers that have taken the training wheels off and are building apps that serve larger workloads? And how do we plan to promote an app that was developed in a productivity environment to an environment that has an ALM process? And how do we structure our environments when different categories of applications are being built? <clears throat> It's important to think ahead for when these situations will arise and to be prepared as part of your governance roadmap. You need to start with the basics and think through different categories of solutions being built. And typically, three different categories are a good way to start. Your productivity apps, your important apps, and your critical apps. This basic structure of environments allows us to bucket applications according to their importance to the business. The development of the cycle, the development cycles of the solution and the number of users being supported and tied to connections required. Productivity environments really should be few and far between. These are usually the initial safe spaces for our makers that they will learn, test, and train in. And these applications will have very few users and a minimal impact on the business. It's unlikely that they would really require any kind of ALM process, and that can be built into the environment containing multiple other productivity solutions. 
Ownership of these solutions is solely on the maker themselves, so IT are never involved in this. When we go one step above, we're looking at important solutions, and those are very business-centric solutions, and they're built usually to solve a business challenge for a team or a department of users. These solutions are typically built by more experienced makers, and they might have a need for an ALM process. Typically, if these apps occur an issue, it does not have a critical impact on the business overall, but it is going to cause an inconvenience to its users. Access to developing these solutions should be managed by the department, and ownership of these solutions is with the makers and business units. And then finally, those 20%, those critical solutions, those are managed and maintained by IT departments because if those go down, they're going to critically impact the function of the business. These environments contain solutions that are going to be critical to the organization, and they're only about 20%, as I mentioned. So there definitely should be a solid ALM process in place, and access is very strictly managed, usually by IT. So by implementing an environment strategy in this way, we can actually now start to plan for when an app should be promoted from productivity to important, all the way up to critical if necessary. And it allows us to ensure ownership and control is with the correct department, and that platform can be adopted at scale when managing tight resources. It's always important to come back to the key reason for implementing a governance strategy. That's our people. And when you build out your center of excellence team, you need to remember for whom you're building the team out. You need to consider how changes are going to impact your makers at all levels at every stage of the roadmap. It's super important that we recognize and we lift up makers. Our super makers are going to be the key to evangelizing the platform and assuring adoption and success across the business. Assigning various levels of responsibility across the platform for the center of excellence team is another recommended way of ensuring that people are kept at the center of the governance efforts. So things like implementing a RACI chart, which is a responsibilities chart, can help people have different levels of engagement with the governance roadmap. And then finally, governance is not a one size fits all. It's really important to remember this, that governance is going to look different at every single organization implementing Power Platform. What works for one organization might not necessarily be a good fit for another. And maturity levels will always vary across the various pillars of the Power Platform. While one organization might have their security policies locked down, they may be lacking in other things like nurturing endeavors. Your governance roadmap is also not a straight line and it's going to evolve constantly in line with the business needs and the development of your makers. It's really important to have a consistent review schedule and ensure that your center of excellence team is keeping makers top of mind. So I'm really hoping from the presentation today that I'm gonna get through it without <clears throat> coughing too hard. <laughs> You can see governance really means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it really does not need to be an overwhelming task. And implementing governance should really empower people to do more at our organizations and reduce the burden on overextended IT departments. So I'm really excited to see where the Power Platform is going to take your organization next. And that's me, <clears throat> my very dry throat. I am free to take questions. I'm muted. I'm muted. Thank, you so, Thank much. you so much. There is a little bit of feedback from your speaker. So while you were doing your presentation, I asked the audience, uh, what does government governance make them think about? And one person um, stated that customers want to lock it down and stop the sprawl. Yeah, that's definitely something that is a common request <clears throat> when it comes to governance, but it really is all about teaching them that you don't have to lock everything down, that you actually can give people 
the space to build and create in a safe way that's not going to impact the organization from a security and a financial perspective. I think that's really important to do because if you lock everything down and don't give anybody access, you're really losing out on a very valuable or opportunity to take your organization productivity to an absolute new level. Oh, I think you're muted again, Rebecca, sorry. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Now is a good opportunity to ask them. Otherwise, um, and was there anything that you wanted to share out? I dropped a couple of links. Let me. Yeah, I think that the things that you actually dropped out were things that I would definitely share, such as the um, the update to the Power Platform Center of Excellence Kit. It does get updated on a monthly basis, so definitely check that out. The, the guidelines to creating to implementing the um, COE is also absolutely excellent for sure. And it's just important to really remember that you're going to implement governance for in a way that's going to work for your organization. I think that's something I can't stress enough is that you're, you're, there's no template for this. There's no you know silver bullet. It is something that is going to be very specific for the organization itself. Awesome. Uh, lots of good thank yous happening in the chat. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you're not familiar with the reactor, if you happen to have found us at random through a YouTube search or uh, through word of mouth, feel free to join us, become a part of the community. We're always putting out free content um, currently in a hybrid setup. Um, so lots of virtual sessions still occurring. And then we also have physical spaces around the world. So you can find us on meetup.com and find a location closest to you. Um, if you're able to come in person, that's great. And otherwise, see you online. And thank you so much, Em. This was fantastic. Really appreciate you coming on and putting this all together. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry for the little throat tickle <laughs> I'm still struggling with, but yes, I really appreciate it. Thanks all. Tis the season. It's spring. Um, all right. Well, take care, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your days. Bye now.